Hello everyone, my name is Michael SK and welcome back to Umineko When They Cry. We are now in episode 4 and we're at St. Lucia. Yeah, that school. We've, we've heard this before, we've heard of this school before. What we're doing here, I have absolutely no idea. I don't remember what the setup was for this one. I know that we saw the, uh, or went through the opening sequence. I didn't, you know, I kept my eyes closed. I, I didn't look at any of that. But we, we did get started with this one. The fourth game has now begun. But let's see what's going on here. We're following around with Ange here at school. Good day to you is the standard greeting used here. No matter how many years pass by, the style of greeting still feels very awkward. Even though I had responded to the greeting in order to stifle that awkward feeling, the classmate who had spoken looked at me blankly. <laughs> What's your problem? Their choice of words and manner were certainly what you'd expect from a school for rich girls, but the actual meaning was as innocent and cruel as you'd expect from kids of that age. It seems they found it funny that I had mistakenly thought the greeting was directed at me. Now it might be the opposite. Maybe they didn't know how to react after being suddenly greeted by a gloomy, quiet kid like me. No, judging by the gazes of my classmates, who were looking this way over their shoulders and whispering to each other. It looked as though some of them considered this refreshing morning ruined. I was dark, because I was disliked. So trying not to get in the way of everyone's refreshing morning anymore, I stooped lower and entered the classroom, almost like I was cutting through the aisle in a movie theater while the movie was running. And this is an all-dorm school, St. Lucia Academy. It's not a school that anyone can get into by taking a test. It's a hidden rich girl school known of only by a select group of celebrities from various fields. For lofty nobles who truly wish their daughters could be raised like saints. This is probably the ideal school in which to protect them from the impurities of the common world. But at the same time, it was probably also convenient for nobles who wanted to confine daughters they didn't want out in public. As well as an academy isolated from the impurities of the common world, it also held excellent potential as a prison school. So I've heard. I was truly among the latter, and was, conf was confined in St. Lucia Academy. Forced to live my life in dreariness. Well, she was thrown in here, as we have found out in episode 3. Of course, there weren't that many students like me, and you couldn't tell us apart at a glance. However, even if we never fessed up about it, you could usually figure out who we were by watching how we acted. After all, we were always hanging our heads with an expression on our faces as though the whole world had abandoned us. Anyway, every class had one or two kids like that, so even if they didn't speak up about it, you could guess who they were. Therefore, even though I never confessed that I was one of those kids, at some point everyone in my class knew about it. Just like how the seriousness of an injury becomes a sign of status in a hospital room, how noble a birth one had become a sign of status here. Those girls who couldn't be acknowledged in public were probably nothing more than filth to the others. And they must have thought that getting involved with such students would dirty them as well. When a, when a rumor sprang up about a particular student, those fastidious girls would grow cold and distant, chasing that student out of all social groups. Thanks to that, I led a quiet school life like this, all by myself. Well, that's only if hearing people whisper behind my back, finding my things lost or broken all the time, and having everyone pretend like they didn't know anything, can be called a quiet school life. No, not really. Not really at all. Even this early in the morning, I must look worn out. I can almost understand why my other classmates, who had a refreshing morning, looked at my face and wanted to click their tongues. Consciously trying to do as I should and avoid tainting my classmates' morning, I quietly took my seat. And then unusually, someone came to talk to me. It was the class leader. Hello. 
as per usual. I'm pretty sure I, I, I'm pretty sure I heard something about that last week, but I thought that the questionnaire hadn't been passed out yet. The details would be written there, so there shouldn't have been any need to remember them beforehand. Well, you believe wrong. Oh, I like how there's no trust. Again, either someone lost my sheet or they intentionally didn't tell me about it. But I have no way of knowing who is behind it. In the end, treating it as though it was my own carelessness would settle everything more quickly. As I hung my head at the class leader's scolding, I could hear the giggles and whispers of people watching coming from no direction in particular. Shiramiya san did it again. She's just so careless. She doesn't deserve to be in this school. She has no dignity and no manners either. I don't know about that last one. She seemed to be trying her best. Sorry girls, but I have dealt with much worse when it comes to unfair personal attacks. As I froze my heart and let those arrows of ridicule pass by, I quickly filled out the questionnaire. This is a fun school life. When I learned that father and mother and Onichan and all the rest of my family had died, I was at the house of my grandpa on my mother's side. The only survivor of the accident was Ushiramiya Eva. Only Aunt Eva. Even at the time, I hadn't really liked Aunt Eva. At a glance, she would act kindly. But even as young as I was, I could see that she was somehow making fun of father and the rest. And I hadn't liked it. So when it was decided that Aunt Eva would take care of me, I was pretty miserable. Maybe it wouldn't have mattered if that gentle Uncle Hideyoshi and George Onichan had been with me. But I hated the thought of living all alone with Aunt Eva. I'd frankly said that to Grandpa, hoping to live together in his house. However, Aunt Eva had been very insistent that she should be the one to look after me. She had no desire to remarry, so as her successor, I was essential if the Ushiramiya family was to continue. Aunt Eva felt very strongly about the family. She insisted that she take charge of me right away, so that she could give me an education and lifestyle fitting for a successor. After that, it seems that confusing negotiations with lawyers took place. But in the end, I was forced to go live with Aunt Eva. Gotta love it. After doing that, Aunt Eva told me something. You must bear all the glory and history of the Ishirabiya family. And in order to make you a fitting successor to bear that, the rest of your life will be dedicated to frantic studying. Sacrifice the rest of your life for the Ishirabiya family. That's what she said. At first, I thought she meant that literally, but I quickly realized that wasn't the case. Because even now, in Aunt Eva's eyes, the one most fitting to succeed her was the late George Onichan. At our first meal together, I received strict instructions and questioning about table manners, and was forced to listen to her abuse that mom and dad her, her abused mom and dad, excuse me, as though they had been neglectful in their discipline. I also received the same strict instructions regarding manners at my first party, and my clumsiness had been disparaged in front of everybody, forcing me to endure insults to mom and dad as well. After that repeated over and over, well, I eventually began to understand. Aunt Ava didn't really want to make me her successor. She thought George Onichan was the only one truly suited to be her successor, and she couldn't forgive the fact that it was to be me instead. So she insulted me in front of a lot of people. She humiliated me, and she made it known exactly how I was inferior to George Onichan to both acquaintances and strangers, surely in place of a memorial service for her dead son. 
Or rather, she must still be mourning his death. So, I still have a lot of questions as to what went down in episode 3. And I definitely feel like when it came to Hideyoshi and George, something went horribly wrong with how things went down. Was Ava the culprit? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, the obvious most, you know, clear path in episode 3 would be to say, oh yeah, she killed some people and she probably did. But there has to be more to it. There has to be. Especially with whatever the hell happened to Nanjo. Because somebody reminded me that he didn't necessarily die to her. So what happened to him? So th there's still a whole lot of questions that I have regarding episode 3 as I'm, you know, slowly but surely remembering the events of that episode. But why would Ava, who very clearly wants George to be the successor, and how she truly loves Hideyoshi, so much so that I think even Hideyoshi stood up for Ava and lied on her behalf, maybe was even in cahoots with her. Why did both of them die? What happened? What went wrong? However, that wasn't something I could endure. I couldn't possibly live together with Aunt Ava. I was kept like a pet. My life continually compared with her dead sons. I understood that even when I was still in elementary school, and I had, tried, or I had tried to escape the Ushurimiya house and run off to the house of my grandpa on my mother's side. However, Aunt Ava had already foreseen that. No, thinking back on it, she might have lured me into escaping. I was caught by the guards and brought back. And for being a coward who had smeared the Ushurimiya family crest with mud and tried to throw it away, in a way that makes my whole body shake and shiver just remembering it, I was punished. How should I describe what Aunt Ava was like when she punished me? In a frenzy? Gleeful? I saw the anger and sadness of losing her beloved son, and well as the hatred, or as well as the hatred and pain from stealing that inheritance from the son who should have received it, and the dark pleasure at being able to let those feelings out on me. I was hit with all of those negative emotions at once. Oh, lovely. Good ol' abuse, you know. Then all of my free time and freedom to act uh, was stolen, and I was put under surveillance around the clock. I may have lived in a gorgeous mansion, dressed in expensive clothes, but my heart and my dignity had been trampled upon, and I was the Ishirimiya family's slave, its cattle. Compared to that lifestyle, the derisive laughter of my classmates here was calm and pleasant. It caused my heart no trouble. Which isn't good to be weakened to that point. To be scarred to that point. After burying almost all of the fields of the questionnaire with nothing in particular, I folded it and put it in my pocket. Because if I left it on my desk, it might disappear again. Smart move. Ah, school life. Private school life. Couldn't be me. During lunch break after dropping it off at the post box in the student council room, I finished lunch by myself as usual and headed behind the school building where no one could be seen. Only my time by myself could protect me from the derisive laughter and gossip. Since I was hated and didn't have a single friend, my time alone was the most kind to me. After checking the surrounding bushes to see whether some malicious classmates were hiding and threatening my time of quiet, I finally relaxed the tension from my entire body, knowing that I had gained some true peace. Look at these fences, man. Jesus Christ. Then I let out a sigh. It faltered heavy as though it was the first time I had breathed out today. My old favorite place behind the vegetable garden storehouse had been found out by my classmates and I had been teased, so this was my new lunchtime hideaway. There was nowhere to sit behind the school building. As I crouched near the wall in the shadow of the bushes, I opened my bag and took out a book with an elaborate old-fashioned binding? Almost said building. Just glancing at it, you'd probably think it was a religious book or something written in the Middle Ages. But this wasn't a book. It was a diary. Of course, it wasn't my diary. There, was, there weren't any special things worth writing about in my daily life. 
Every single day was just gray, cold and dry. In those completely unchanging days, there aren't any changes worth writing down. This was the diary of Maria Onechan, a girl I had been very close to. She had been a bit strange and three years older than me, but Onechan was always a warm, wonderful cousin and very annoying. She would always grab me by my hand and let me join in on some fun game. I remember that being able to or that being able to see her was the most fun part of our family gatherings. When I opened the diary, the characters, which were made fairly skillfully considering that this was an elementary schooler, were packed close together, though they were written on every other line. Was she just hopelessly obsessed with jotting everything down in her diary? Probably not. To her, writing her daily life down in a diary was probably like having a conversation with another part of herself. So rather than an object on which the events of her day were written down, Maria Onechan's diary was written like a letter to another part of herself, telling of the events of that day. I found this diary among her belongings after her death and secretly took it home. At first, I felt that reading someone else's diary might be boorish and satisfied myself with just keeping it by my side. But I couldn't help flipping through the pages and reading through it bit by bit. I think in a case like this, you know, it's not really an invasion of privacy. I mean, it kind of is, but I think it's important. You know, however you're going to look at it, I think it's very important to read a diary of somebody that went through such an event, you know? We've heard of cases where a diary has come in handy to try and figure things out, to solve not really a mystery, but to really figure out a story. And by now, she had become my only friend. I gently opened to the page with the bookmark. Is this how we're going to go through the, uh, is this how we're going through the story? Or is this just the telling of the episode 3 story? At the same time, a very, very soft breeze blew, tickling the paper. I thought the open diary might have sparkled faintly. The weather's good today. Maria Onechan loves the wonderful rays of sunlight. So I'm sure she's in a good mood. On the pages of the open diary, no, in the world of the diary, Maria Onechan showed herself. Well, that's fucking weird. I'm pretty sure she was nine when she died. So her form was already younger than me. But I call her Onechan, so she affectionately calls me Ange. Oh, Ange, today's time was slow. Was it slow? Yes, I've been slow. I've been slow. I've been Oh, is that how that logic works? Maybe she realized I was holding a grudge because that duty had been forced upon me and shortened my lunch break by a bit. Maria Onechan brightly changed the subject. And grateful for that act of kindness, I responded by saying I was a slow eater. Maria calmed me down, saying something about teaching me the trick to eating fast. I read about it in her diary. No, I heard it from Maria Onechan. She was ranked number one among the girls in the speed eating, speed eating ranking for her grades newspaper. She was apparently very proud of that, but a little disappointed that her mother, Aunt Rosa, hadn't praised her very much for it. <laughs> えっと、ここまでよ。
one. Eto, eto. When I looked at Maria Onechan, who was always in a good mood, it made my heart feel warm as well. As I listened to her tale, I began to get absorbed into her world. A part of me wants to say that this is pretty freaky, but also like, could loneliness really do this to you, you know? Are we actually going further back? Happy yep, we are. Maria? We are going back, back, back. ママも プロシュートピッチャに変えてもいい。え、いいわよ。本当に食べられるならね。でも、いっか。誕生日だしね。ちゃんとお行儀よく待ってたいいこのマリアにご褒美もないとね。じゃあ、じゃあ、デザートにエ
yeah, I think when the family is together, that's that's all that's needed, really. Whenever I was a kid, having a whole bunch of my family over was all I really, really needed. When friends came as well, that was cool, but it's when the family was there that I felt truly happy, you know? That's when I was like, all right, this is a good time. Hell yeah, they are. <laughs> Maria Onechan peeked into my happy memory as I sat quietly wearing the origami helmet that Dad had made for me. I was a little embarrassed, and my right hand was a paper gun that Battler Onechan had folded for me. And Mom was taking a commemorative photo. It was the happiest moment of my life. All right, but back to your memory. Sakutaro is the name of a stuffed animal that Maria was to receive that day. For quite some time before then, Aunt Rosa had been making a stuffed animal to give Maria as a present today. Hearing that it was a cute lion stuffed animal, Maria Onechan had already given it the name Sakutaro, even though she hadn't received it yet. Today she was looking forward to meeting Sakutaro, even more than her own birthday. Aunt Rosa ran a clothing design company. It seemed to be some kind of brand name. What was it? Auntie Rosa? Auntie Rosa? Just what? It seemed their catchphrase was, I can't forgive the me of yesterday. Unfortunately, I've never met at someone who knew of that brand name. Maybe it wasn't that famous. So Aunt Rosa was pretty skilled with her hands. I heard that she made some of the clothing that she wore herself. So making a stuffed animal had to be well within her capabilities. That is. うん。本当はサクラって付けたかった。でも、オスライオンのぬいぐるみだから男の子の名前にしなさいって言われたの。だから男の子っぽく太郎を加えてサクタロ。最後の絵はいつの間にかなくなっちゃった。なんでサクラ
ここはお外なんだからはしゃいじゃダメよ約束できるうん約束するするだから開けてもいい開けてもいいまあまあはいはいちょっとだけよ<laughs> Before Aunt Rosa finished talking, Maria started unwrapping it. Oh, here we go. Moment of truth. Oh, yeah, that looks good. As soon as she did, yellow and orange peeked out. What appeared was a slightly blank looking lion stuffed animal with cute round eyes and a white chest. It was about the size of a small pillow. It looked pretty big next to someone as short as Maria Onechan, but it probably wasn't that large. From the perspective of someone who didn't know better, it was probably or it would probably look like something cheap bought from a department store or something. But to Maria Onechan, it was her mother's handmade stuffed animal, and the only one of its kind in the world and irreplaceable. Well, this is a nice little moment here, isn't it? Honestly, it kind of reminds me of Cone from Bleach. <laughs> but a whole lot nicer looking. Was he ever brought up? Like, was that name actually ever referenced in any of the previous episodes? マリアに元気がない時には励ましてくれて、ママが仕事で忙しくて一人ぼっちでも寂しくないし、学校で誰も遊んでくれなくても、マリアは元気がない時には励ましてくれて、マリアが元気な時は一緒にいっぱい遊
マリアはその子をかばってあげられるの。As she said that, she smiled faintly. Maria Onechan's way of thinking really is unusual. That is true. According to her, from the very beginning, a witch had resided in that place called a school. No, she says that any place where a lot of people gather will have a witch residing there. The witch tries to steal the students' souls through death by disease or accidents. Apparently, she sometimes also corrupts those souls, leading them down that path of evil. She says that an angel came, not content to let that continue. でも魔女は兄弟で戦いは7日7番に及んだんだけどそれでも決着しなかった疲れ切った魔女は休戦しようと言ってこう提案したの前に聞いたわ私はこれまでクラスの生徒の半分を病気にしたり怪我をさせたりしてきましたでもその代わりに残りの半分の生徒は病気と怪我から守ってきました What the hell? だからもしもクラスの一人を私へのいけにえにいじめられっ子にしてくれるならそのほか全員の生徒を病気や怪我から守りましょうだったっけ That kind of reminds me of the stupid ass plot line behind、uh, another You guys ever watch that one? That is just so ridiculous 天使様は考えたのクラスの半分が不幸になることに比べたらクラスの一人だけが不幸になることの方がずっといいそれに魔女はその強力な力で他全員の生徒の安全を守ってくれるというクラスに40人の生徒がいるとして20人の犠牲者が1人に減って19人が助かるというわけね実に合理的な提案 I wonder if there's some theme behind this fairy tale if it's a creation by Maria Onechan a nine year old girl that'd be pretty impressive 天使様はその提案And they never will thank you. Maria Onechan's idea was too compassionate. Both of us are suffering from a very similar type of misfortune. And yet, maybe a small difference in our way of thinking changes how peaceful our hearts are. So, Maria Onechan is not a good thing. Oh, it's not a good thing. But, it's not a good thing. 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 Maria Onechan hugged the Sakutaru stuffed animal. Playing both sides of the conversation herself. I don't understand it, but that's exactly why I want to reach Maria Onechan's level. So I was intensely drawn to her tale and her words. But. サクタラもお友達になればもっと楽しくなるよ<笑>じゃあ今日からサクタラもエンジェの新しいお友達だよ<笑>ねサクタラ So not only does Ange have a friend in you know a dead girl but now she has a friend in a stuffed animal may, which may or may not be around anymore We have to consider that But the friendship levels really are increasing here God damn it. Technically, this is another character that's being introduced in the story. Skillfully moving the stuffed animal like it was a puppet, Maria Onechan expressed Sakutaro's emotions. She was controlling him, but the charming way he waved his short hand and cocked his head to the side made it feel like he really was a new friend called Sakutaro. Of course, looking at it with cold eyes, It would only appear that Maria Onechan was comforting to me, or com comforting me, the hell did I say, when I was grumpy. But a soul had definitely been sent into that stuffed animal. The soul of Maria Onechan's love. So I acknowledge the existence of being, or of a being called Sakutaro, inside that stuffed animal. Look, Angel, I'm going to be a little bit of 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 a little
ほら咲くたらもご挨拶ブリュヘンジ怖い人 Yes. As Sakutaru timidly looked at me, he unexpectedly met my gaze and hid behind Maria Onechan's back in surprise. Maria Onechan really is good at playing with stuffed animals. As kids tend to be. I held out my hand as though asking for a handshake, and Sakutaru's short hand was stuck out towards me, lightly touching my index finger. After all, when a human and a stuffed animal shake hands, their sizes are too different. This greeting by touching each other's fingers was our handshake. The more the merrier, as they say. Maria Onechan had given the name Sakutaro to the stuffed animal that she had received on her birthday and had warmed and expanded his existence in her heart for a long, long time. Therefore, even before she met him, his existence was sublimated into a personality. Even at the first moment they met, they were already friends. Of course, that wasn't anything extraordinary in Maria o Onechan's eyes, although I don't think she personified and loved anything quite as much as Sakutaro. She loved the things she owned very much, treating them like just like friends or beloved pets. Maybe Aunt Rosa hadn't let her keep a pet at some point in time, so she felt like treasuring objects instead. And maybe she was so isolated that she had been forced to find a friend nearby. Because of all of that, what happened that day wasn't anything extraordinary from her perspective. Even so, Sakutaro, no, maybe I should call it Sakutaro, yeah, without the U, like Maria Onechan. Uh, there's no doubt that Sakutaro was a stuffed animal. No, a friend whom she had loved more than anything or anyone. Uh oh. What's going on here? It was already about nine at night. Rosa had asked because this wasn't a good time to have a friend over, and she had been just a little surprised. But when she thought about it, Maria didn't have any friends who would come over to play, did she? Even so, to think that she'd have so much fun playing with that stuffed animal, Rosa was very pleased that Maria had liked her birthday present so much. Rosa was surprised that Maria had accepted so easily that she wouldn't be able to come home from work. To Rosa, having to tell Maria that she'd be coming home late or staying overnight was a huge burden. Maria would start crying about how lonely she was on the other end of the phone, and it took a lot of time and effort to calm her down. To think that Maria would accept it in such high spirits. Is this also thanks to Sakutaro? Rosa, or Rosa was once again pleased that she'd given her daughter such a good present. I think, again, whenever it's something, when it's something handmade, when they put a lot of effort and time towards it and it continues to make them happy, yeah, no, it's going to make everybody really, really happy. From Maria's manner of speech, Rosa got the feeling that Maria might have gone shopping with that stuffed animal without her, not, without her knowing about it. Rosa's forehead creased 
And after sourly saying that Maria definitely mustn't do that, she hung up. Ooh. So then she proceeded to do that. Look at this goddamn room. Jesus, the amount of stuffed animals. I like that giant penguin there. That's a nice one. Because you gotta watch the house. ぼくがマリアと一緒にいるのを見られると恥ずかしいんだよ。恥ずかしい。なんでママはよく僕を外に連れて行っちゃいけないって言うし、マリアのことをよくもう何歳になったんだからダメとかそういう。マリアは咲
そうねそしてそれは見えなくても普段から私たちと身近にあるものだわそういうことマリアもサクタロもいつだってエンジェのすぐ近くで一緒なんだよ神様や精霊守護霊も私たちのすぐ身近にいるのでも意識しないと存在を感じられない目では見えない風のようにでもそれは確実に私たちの身近にあって魔力という煙がたなびけば誰にだって見えるものなの I thought I'd only be able to meet Maria Onechan while this diary was open. But from what she says, she's always with me. And I can meet her at any time if I truly desire to. Maria was given the Nikki, and he was given the Kiroki, and he was given the Kiroki, and he was given the Kiroki. How does that work? So, the Nikki was Maria and Maho and the Kiroki. But it was a very good thing, and the Kiroki was not the same as the Kiroki. So, the Kiroki was. 私にだけはわかるのうんだってエンジェはマリアと同じで魔女の力を宿しているものエンジェだってちゃんとお勉強すればきっと将来立派な魔女になれるんだよ魔女それは楽しいのかしらうん楽しいよそうすれば日記を開かなくてもマリアやサクタロがいつも身近にいるのがわかるようになるよそしたら毎日がとっても楽しくなるそしたらエンジェにマリアは他にもたくさんのお友達を紹介できるよそしたら毎日が忙しくてとっても賑やかになるよそれは楽しいかもしれないマリアお姉ちゃんが残した魔導書も持ってるわ今度真面目に読んでみるわねそしたら私も一人ぼっちじゃない Oh no, this is how she gets into the occult Maria Onechan and Sakutaro said that at the same time, happy that I had developed an interest in the world of witches. Yeah, careful there, Ange. Careful. There's no going back. Are we still following Maria around? I think we are. With her knapsack on her back and half of Sakutaro's face peeking out of it, she triumphantly walked through the shopping district late at night. Well, it was that time of day after all. Everyone in the shopping district was either a shop owner lowering the shutters on their shops, or an employee rushing or else staggering on their way home. Amidst all that, Maria, who was in a good mood like someone on a, on a hike, probably looked quite merry. Every once in a while, passing employees would glance at her back with the eyes of someone seeing something out of place. Office ladies giggled at the cute stuffed animal poking its head out of the knapsack. The supermarket had been closed for a while by this time. However, convenience stores, which had been growing in popularity lately, stayed open until midnight. It was very convenient for Maria, whose mother's return was often late. Maria lowered the knapsack from her back, and carrying it like a child in her arms, she headed over to the sweet bun's corner. She pointed to a sweet bun that she had eaten before, explaining to Sakutaru that this was, or this one was delicious. And that one was pretty good too. Sakutaru seemed to be enjoying it a lot. Maria was a sweet bun. This is one of the things that we can eat with apple, cream, and ichigo jam. But sometimes it's a little bit of a wee swan and a little bit of a wee swan. Apple is a good thing. Oh, dear. It's a lot of things in the world. Oh, dear. あとはマリアはフルーツヨーグルトにするフルーツ入ってるけどお菓子じゃないよねうんきっとママも大丈夫サクタルもどれか欲しい Yeah, none of this seems like an actual dinner, by the way. いいの I thought she was supposed to get like a bento. お金は大丈夫うん、全然平気ほら、聖徳太子なのうん OK だからサクタルにも好きなものを買ってあげられるよ When Maria made to grab another one of the same fruit yogurt, Sakutaru bent his head slightly worried. Sakutaro to 
Maria put the three colored bread and the two yogurts into a shopping basket and brought them to the register. The man running the register had been in charge of the tobacco shop that had been here until last year. Uh-oh. The man working at the store took a can of leftover soda or something from behind the register and packed it into the bag with everything else. I mean, the receipt will show what she actually bought, but will she believe it? Since she had been told not to buy soda, she couldn't take it back home. So she decided to drink it on her way back and not bring the empty can back home. Kinda smart. With the vinyl bag with the sweet bun in it around her elbow, holding the knapsack with Sakutaro in it, with that same arm and drinking her soda, the two of them walked home. <laughs> of course, it's not like she could actually make a stuffed animal drink soda. She just put the can to Sakutaro's mouth and pretended to tilt it. But it was fun for Maria to, sh to share the taste of this weird drink that she had gotten for free with Sakutaro. There was a huge moon in the sky. At times, that moon had been clouded by tears when she had been unmanageable during Rose's overnight stays, and when she'd been scolded by her mother. But this moon was very warm, and it seemed to wash over the two of them as they enjoyed their trip home by themselves. Maria and Sakutaro. Ange watched the two of them go from behind. She looked so warm from behind. After looking at the backs of Maria Onechan and Sakutaro together, it became very hard to remember all of those long nights when she had cried because her mother hadn't come home. I couldn't say it to Maria Onechan, but if I had been in the same position, I may have given a stuffed animal the name Sakutaro, but it wouldn't have been anything more or less than a stuffed animal. Anyone can make a relationship that only distracts you from your loneliness. But Maria Onechan was different. Sakutaro isn't a stuffed animal or a toy. He was a real friend. And far from just distracting Maria from her loneliness, he changed the nights without her mother into a fun time where they could play all by themselves. Whatever works, right? Was it because Sakutaro was a special stuffed animal? Because her mother had made it herself? Because it was very, very cute? Probably not. If there's a secret here, it doesn't lie within Sakutaro. I think it probably lies within Maria Onechan. Probably. これが even if I, locked up in an academy without a single friend, had power like Maria Onechan, I wonder if I can make my days just a bit richer. I wonder if I'll be able to honestly shed tears on nights I feel like crying, to smile on gray nights. マジョになれる資格があるもん。マジョになる資格。マリアもマジョになれる資格あるんだよ。だからまだまだ勉強中の修行中なの。きっと素敵なマジョになって、放棄でお空を掛けて、剣で虹を描いて、飴玉を空から
On that desolate night, when no flower of a smile could possibly have bloomed, her magic surely gave birth to a smile. Or a small piece of craziness. だってほら、もうこの世にはいない私をこうして呼び出して語らっているよ。これは魔法なの？うん。私が日記に残した魂のかけらをエンジェは魔法で膨らませて私を蘇らせてる。さっきも言ったよね。こうして私と再会して会話
I feel like Maria Onechan was cheering me on inside my heart. She's cheering me on. Really? Or do I just think that she is? No, that's wrong. It's because I think this that I cannot see her. Maria Onechan is always by my side. And even now, she's definitely there cheering me on to do my best. That reached my ears. So I mustn't ignore it like it's my imagination or the voice of my own heart. I believe the Maria Onechan is there. I mustn't doubt. I believe. Onechan said that she'd always be by my side. I must not doubt that. But looking at that empty space by the empty back wall of the school building, amidst those almost heartlessly boring rays of sunlight, calling out her name was unexpectedly difficult. The chains of common sense that had clung to me until today sneered at me, telling me that calling out to the empty air was ridiculous. But it was almost like being told to take a step forward off the roof of a skyscraper overlooking a sea of lights. It's Maria Onechan saying it. It's all right. She's saying that I'm someone who can do it. Stop thinking that you might fail, or fall, excuse me, or that it would be foolish to take a step off of a roof and free yourself from those chains of common sense. And there she is? Maybe? I steadied my breathing. I concentrated my mind. Make the vivid form of Maria Onechan in the empty space before you. Rise to the surface. Understand magic and see Maria Onechan. And there she is. Maybe. Maybe. Maria Onechan. <laughs> At that time, I was answered by a rustle in the bushes and a wild cry, and I came to my senses. It looked like I wasn't the only one behind the school building. Now, since I'd been so immersed in the world of the diary, I hadn't noticed someone coming. I recognized a group of three beyond the bushes. They were kids from my class. From their appearance, it felt as though they'd come behind the school building to gossip about someone or talk in secret. I hurried out of that place because if it became known that I'd been alone in a place like this, mumbling to myself, it'd become a pain again. Oh boy. I could hear the shrill, loud laughter from behind. Irritated that, er, irritated and feeling that Maria Onechan had been made fun of, I left that place at a quick pace, and then a jog once I turned the corner. And I might have made it to Onechan's world with just a little bit more time. It was frustrating, aggravating. Why does everyone get in my way? I haven't gotten in anyone else's way, not even once. I ran and ran, but it still felt as though I could hear their shrill laughter. Ah, uh, what a rough time trying to go, you know, crazy and all that. But we're working on it. We are working on it there. And now we're even further into the future. I think maybe we're still following Ange right now. Maybe. Maybe that's the case. It's weird how we've been jumping around here, but we kind of did that in episode two. Whoa. Who are you? Alright. But yeah, we're, we're still following Ange, it seems. Alrighty. Well, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here on this one. I feel like we made some pretty good progress here. So, uh, yeah. I, I, I would say that we are continuing to set up whatever the fourth game has in store. In a very similar way to Episode 2, how we took some time to... You know, get to see another side of Shannon, Kanon, and Jessica, and maybe a teeny tiny bit of George, that really painted some pictures, and, you know, we had a little bit of a different perspective on the characters whenever they had their moments, or right before they did, you know? But, yeah, I, I think there's something to really come of this. We'll just have to wait and see. Thank you all for tuning in to this one. I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, all that fancy jazz. And I will see you guys in the next one.
Take it easy.